Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Dome to Home on Fisk Planetarium's YouTube channel. My name is Jeremy. I am the navigator. I'll be uh, flying us around looking at some cool Earth stuff today because it is Earth Month. We've got Earth Day coming up tomorrow. And so today uh, we are going to be looking at how humans have impacted the Earth and how we've changed things on our planet and in our home, uh, both for us and for animals and everything else that we have here on our planet. Um, as always, with me, uh, we've got my friend Tara. How's it going today, Tara? Doing awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Tara, in case you didn't remember, because uh, I haven't been here in like three weeks, so I'm super excited to be back on Dome to Home this week. Um, I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum and a presenter here at the planetarium and all that cool stuff. So we're super stoked to talk to you today about all this cool satellite Earth stuff. Um, and we also have our question master, Ramey, behind the scenes, who's monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions at any point through the show, drop them in that chat. Or there's also a link um, in the description of the episode for a Google form. So if you have trouble using the chat in the YouTube, um, you can use that Google form, submit your questions that way, and she'll pass those over to us. So we've got some time dedicated at the end of the show for those questions, but we'll try to answer some as we go, too. Um, and also, if you have trouble seeing any of these uh, pictures or illustrations or videos at any point, go ahead and make your YouTube full screen because that will help because we have so many cool videos to show you guys today. It's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah. We've got a very special show planned for everybody. And uh, why don't we just get on into it? We don't want to waste any more time, Hunter. Huh, yeah, for sure. So like Jeremy kind of said earlier, today we're talking about how people change the environment and how we can use satellites to monitor those changes. I know we've been talking about satellites for weeks now, but today we're specifically looking at man-made changes. So you're probably pretty familiar with the idea of humans changing the environment. We do this in all sorts of ways. So we're going to look at a couple different ones today. And first, we're going to use this really awesome thing called the Google Earth Engine. This shows us some really amazing visualizations. And it's something that's free and open source. And you, yes, you, can go online and access this Google Earth Engine and see all of these other cool things, too. Yeah, I'll go ahead and paste that in the chat right now. Uh, we'll also make sure to include that link in the description of this video for anybody that's watching uh, afterwards. And so here we are, we're looking at Boulder and what the Google Earth Engine does is it takes uh, satellite imagery of anywhere on the globe uh, from 1984 all the way up to 2020, 2018 maybe? I think 2020. Um, and so here you can see our campus. Uh, we are where we would be if we were in Fisk Planetarium is kind of right here where my little mouse is, maybe like right in here. And we don't see that much change uh, maybe in the last 30 years in Boulder. You can see kind of the outskirts of Boulder, you know, maybe there's some new towns or new homes kind of popping up here. But we have a couple uh, places on the planet that we really want to show you <clears throat> so we can really get a good idea of what type of changes uh, have occurred over the last 30 some years. So right now we're zooming out. Uh, we're going to go look at a glacier field in Alaska. So it's going to zoom us out and fly us on over there. And in particular, this is the Columbia Glacier that we're looking at. You can see it's zooming in here. So glaciers and glacial retreat and glacier loss is a big deal and probably something that you might have heard about with climate change and, you know, human created climate change, especially a lot of the things that we're doing, like burning fossil fuels and putting CO2 into the atmosphere, increasing our greenhouse gases is causing rising temperatures across the globe. And so one of the uh, repercussions of that is that all of our glaciers are starting to melt. This is bad for a lot of reasons, right. um, but here I think this is really cool because you can see really distinctly how much of this glacier has disappeared in the last 30 some odd years. 
Now glaciers do kind of go back and forth. They'll melt a little bit and reform in the winter and melt in the summer, but this is unheard of to lose this much of a glacier. And this is happening with all of the glaciers around the world. They're not only shrinking in size, but they're not rebounding as much in the winter like they normally would. So we're losing tons and tons of glacial ice. And all of that water ends up in our oceans, which causes all sorts of other problems. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ocean stuff in a little while. So yeah, and really I think uh, one of the big things to note about glaciers is you can see that this glacier especially is uh overlying water so a lot of people you know kind of have the misconception of like if you know a lot i always hear well if i put if i fill up a glass of water all the way with ice and then i let the ice melt you know the glass isn't going to overflow so we're not going to have any ra rising sea levels but the issue here um is if there's glaciers you know that are over on the land too so that aren't actually displacing any water to begin with um, so kind of up in these little uh, tributaries areas um, like this, if that ice melts, it has to go into the ocean. And that's what causes that rise in sea level. Exactly. And that's the big problem with the uh, glaciers that are melting in Antarctica. The mm -hmm. Antarctic ice sheet is not floating on the water. It's on the land. So all of that ice that's on the land is being transported into the water. And so that's a big, con a big thing that's happening. Right. So this is kind of an effect that we see, uh, you know, when we study ice and how, you know, that can lead to sea level changes. And we're going to get a little bit uh, into sea level rise a little bit later in the show. Uh, but next, let's look at uh, something that might be a little bit more familiar to us humans, and that's going to be deforestation. So to take a, a good kind of satellite view on that, we're going to go uh, down to Bolivia into the forest, and we're going to see how this one forested region has changed over the last 37 years. So here we are, we're right. zooming in, we see nice green foresty areas. This is what it looked like in 1984. And then as this kind of renders out, you'll start to see some of some changes uh, start to appear. And what are we really looking at here, Tara? Well, all of that brown stuff that you see appearing is browned. They're taking out the trees, it's exposing the land, and of course, they do, you know, we do remove trees for a lot of reasons that are helpful for humans. You know, they're doing it for uh, lumber to build and, you know, grow their houses and towns and things. They're also clearing land for agriculture, grazing cattle, growing crops, feeding people. These are not in themselves bad things, but when you're removing a lot of trees and doing a lot of deforestation, that's when you start running into problems. A, because as we know, trees breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen, the opposite of what we do. So if we have less trees, we have less things around us to get rid of some of that carbon dioxide that's coming out into the air, especially the stuff that we as humans are putting in the air. So there's more CO2 to begin with and less things to help us get rid of the CO2. Plus, we have to think about as they're doing this land clearing, they're using big tractors and ditch diggers and all sorts of uh, really heavy machinery, which puts out even more greenhouse gases, burning fossil fuels. We also see increases in things like methane, which is another really powerful greenhouse gas that comes from livestock. It's basically cow farts, <laughs> really, really powerful greenhouse gas. And if we're clearing all this land, for agriculture, we're also increasing the methane production in the area. So it can be kind of a runaway effect when we start with this deforestation kind of thing. Yeah, and I just want to make sure we're keeping our smooth stream here. We've got a lot. This uh, is taking uh, quite a bit of my computer's power, but I think hopefully we're still good. And if you look kind of around, not so much these little brown areas, but you can see kind of maybe some roads and rivers. Um, you can also see some cities start to appear. So obviously uh, another thing we can track with satellite data is actually like the growth of human population and where we are you know, building our new cities. And I think one of the best examples of this is if we take a trip uh, to the other side of the world and we like, go over to Dubai. 
Um, if people have never heard of Dubai or maybe some of the the growth that they've you know really implemented there, uh, you're going to enjoy this this little time lapse over the last 37 years. It's pretty crazy. It's one of my favorite ones to view because uh, as we view it, as we zoom in here, we'll see uh, the city or is it a, a nation of Dubai? It's a city. A city. In the okay. UAE. Yeah, correct. So we see the city. There's nothing in the water to begin with. If it once it goes back to 1984. And then all of a sudden around, let's see, about 2008, boom, palm trees. Palm trees. <laughs> so they basically created their own islands by, you know, transporting sand and building up and concrete and everything and building up, you know, these really nice resorts and everything out in the ocean. Um, and around here, if I pan up a little bit, you can see the growth of even the city uh, back this way you know, it was pretty much completely un unpopulated. And then over the years, you can really see all these new houses and homes and buildings and, uh, you know, companies really starting to, to grow all these businesses. Um, yeah. And when you're thinking about Dubai, too, it's it's kind of like you may think of like Las Vegas here in the United States, you might be a little more familiar with this. This is a city in the middle of the desert. They don't have fresh water that's accessible. They don't have things growing that they can build their houses out of. So, you know, it's they're bringing in a lot of resources in order to create all of these houses and buildings and fake islands that they're creating. <laughs> and so that's a big problem in itself is bringing all of this material into the city. They also have to use a lot of technology just to make the city livable. They have things like desalination plants. That's how they get most of their water. Since there's no fresh water available, they can take seawater and remove the salt from it, which is cool, but this requires huge amounts of energy, tons and tons of electricity. And all of that electricity is not always coming from renewable sources. They're not using solar power or wind power. This is mostly, again, coal or fossil fuels that are being used to power these desalination plants. We also know that, you know, large scale construction, building the tallest buildings in the world, burns a lot of fossil fuels as well for all of the machinery and the cranes and the diggers and everything. Plus, you know, you're building a huge urban area where people <laughs> like to drive their cars and you know, there's factories and all sorts of stuff like that. So with this urbanization and the explosion of populations in these resource scarce areas, you're actually creating a lot of problems that wouldn't otherwise be there. So that's something that we always have to think about, you know, growing a cool city is awesome, but there's a lot of repercussions that come with that. Yeah. And I think one of the, you know, most obvious repercussions uh, would be light pollution. Obviously, if we build up cities, we are going to want to be able to see what we're doing. Um, and unfortunately, we can uh, show you a couple of videos of what that might look like from up at the ISS. Uh, yeah, the ISS. So this is an ISS flyover. Uh, that was a simulation. But this is an actual uh, live video. Well, it was live at one point. It is a video taken from the ISS. And you can see... Uh, the aurora borealis up towards the northern pole of our planet as we're passing over here comes the city of uh, chicago you can see the city of detroit there and the those big dark patches are the great lakes yeah and i will go ahead and plug this cool new app that i found called iss live now where you can go online and see where the iss is at any point and it's pointed down at the ground with a camera so you can watch it fly over places like the united states you can see where it goes over your house and you can see all of this light pollution and these human effects in real time it's super cool and a lot of people always ask us okay well what's the big deal with light pollution who cares about that besides astronomers <laughs> well, lots of people should. In fact, there's a whole uh, group of people called the International Dark Sky Association that track these things, this light pollution. And they've reported that over 35% of night light in the U.S. is being wasted by inefficient lighting. So that's lighting that's not actually going down to the ground. It's just going up into the sky. And so that's about $3 billion worth of wasted power every year which produces 15 million tons of CO2. 
And if that's not bad enough, there's all sorts of other environmental effects as well, particularly it can upset bird migrations uh, and wetland breeding patterns. There's a whole bunch of problems for nocturnal animals, you can imagine. And then even with people, research has suggested that artificial light and disrupting your sleep patterns, your circadian rhythm, uh, can contribute to obesity, depression, diabetes, breast cancer, and more. So it's really, a lot. <laughs> it's, a, it's not just an astronomer's problem. This is a big deal for a lot of populations on the earth. Yeah. And so, Tara, you pointed out that, you know, all this extra light pollution can have impacts on animals and how they migrate. And so this is another thing that we can look at using satellites from space. Um, what we're seeing here on the dome on wrapped around the globe is uh, annual bird migration, migratory patterns. So these little black dots, maybe if I center us back over here, uh, those are the paths that, you know, these big flocks of birds uh, and other flying animals take over the course of the year. And this color, you know, you can see the redder colors are supposed to represent warmer areas. So it's kind of switching uh, between winter and summer. And so you can see how, you know, the birds move back and forth. Um, but if we use this type of data over many, many years, then we can start to track the differences and see where uh, these birds are flying to or where they're not flying to. Yep. And then with changing temperatures on seasonal scales, that changes these birds' migrations. So sometimes if it's warmer in a place that's supposed to be cold, the birds will stay longer or different birds will come. Cold weather birds will lose their habitats. So we also see not only the birds that are traditionally migratory through this area, they're getting new kinds of birds. And occasionally these can be what we call invasive species, species that are non-native that are coming in and that can disrupt the whole ecosystem. We see this all the time with animals that come in and overpower the balance. It's a super delicate balance and everything is so interconnected. And we also see these migration patterns change with things like urbanization, building cities, uh, habitat destruction, also for building cities or creating ag agricultural areas, uh, wetland losses, changing coastlines, again with that sea level rise, all of this different stuff can disrupt these poor animals that have to go back and forth and it really causes a lot of problems. So it's not just humans that are feeling the effects of this environmental change, it's all of the environment. Yeah, so and another thing we can uh, look at with our satellites from space, um, as we kind of showed in uh, this migratory bird patterns, is we can also take a look at global temperatures. And so what are we looking at here, Tara? So this shows us not just the global temperatures, it's what we call temperature anomalies. So that's just telling us where the temperature is not where it's supposed to be. We have, we have lots of great temperature records going really far back. So we have a good idea of what the average temperature in a specific location should be. So in this map, the places that are kind of that orangish yellow color are where it's hotter than we would expect it to be. Blues are where it's colder than we would expect it to be. And both of those are a problem. People think of climate change and they think of global warming. Well, it's not just warming, it's warming in places where it shouldn't be and much colder in other places where it shouldn't be. We see much more extreme temperature changes. Probably noticed it's snowing in Boulder today. That's not <laughs> terribly unusual, but 60 years ago, that might've been unheard of. And so these are things that affect the whole planet. And I like that you can see that in these visualizations. It's not just, here in the United States or in Dubai or somewhere in China or something like that. This is the whole globe that's being affected. But we don't want this to be all doom and gloom because climate change is really hard to talk about and it does get pretty depressing sometimes. That's right. But the cool thing about these satellites is that we don't just use them to track bad things. But we can take all of that data that we do collect and use that to help us learn more about our climate. And in particular, it can help us do things like predict and prevent natural disasters. We're getting much better at that. And it can also help us um, help people in the event of like climate related disasters like hurricanes and power outages and things like that. 
So we're going to look at a couple of those now too, because there's some really cool examples. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and we're going to look uh, specifically at Hurricane Maria, uh, which some of you uh, will probably remember remember from the it was from 2017, I want to say. Uh, it was the big hurricane that came through uh, and hit Puerto Rico, leading to the longest blackout uh, in U.S. history. And so also did, did a lot of damage to the Arecibo telescope. That yeah. was the first big strike against mm -hmm. Arecibo. It's true. And so on this uh, kind of visualization here with this data, you can kind of see uh, the storm begin to form and it's on a loop right now. So you'll see it forming and then kind of moving through uh, that kind of Gulf area and up the coast a little bit. Um, and so we can use satellites to be able to view this type of data after the fact and you know track it and this can help us kind of make predictions of where storms are going to be moving in the future but another cool thing that we can do is we can use this or use our satellites to view oops if i can pull it up here to view things uh like these storms and what that means for like which areas actually got hit the hardest so this is a video uh, that NASA put together, and it's going to walk us through satellite uh, imagery. And so we're going to zoom in on Puerto Rico, and it's going to enhance the photo a little bit. And then using you know some like radar and some other, I think maybe sonar or some other different satellite imagery, we can look at all the lights on the island before the storm. And then as the storm goes across that red line, you can see it is very dark. There's practically no lights there. And then now we're looking at four months after. Now we're at, I think, what does that say? Six months after. Six months. And so you can start to see how, you know, how the island started to come back. And this is important for, you know, rescue teams. If people don't know who needs the most help and who is out of power, it, well, it can be hard to go find them and give them aid. Um, so using satellites can be a really useful tool and being able to uh, react quicker to these natural disasters that we see. Especially in places like Puerto Rico that are really heavily forested. It's hard for us to just look down on these, like say from a plane or something and see where people have no power. But using satellites, we can use things like infrared, which is probably what we're looking at here with all of these lights um, to get a good idea of where we should send our disaster recovery people who needs help out there. And it's a great realization of how many people were affected by this one storm. That year 2017 was the most deadly hurricane season on record. That was the same year that we saw Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. And that was a big mess. There was even a hurricane that hit the UK that year. And that does not happen very often. <laughs> it was a pretty nasty year. So we can also use that not just for disaster recovery, but also disaster monitoring. So that's what we're going to look at next is this really cool video of cleaning up an oil spill. We've got just a second to load here. Yeah, so here we go. We're going to uh, zoom in to the Mississippi River Delta here. And we're going to focus on the big oil spill uh, on the Deepwater Horizon rig that many people probably remember. And so you see down in the kind of lower right center, we have the rig. All this kind of brown stuff uh, up to the top left, that was normal sediment that comes out of uh, the river delta. And then it'll start using, you know, piecing forward, moving forward through satellite imagery here. And we can start to see some of the oil slick start to be spilling out. Isn't that gross? Yeah, so now you start to see all this kind of like dark gray imagery on the uh, the bottom right there. We're in May 20, May 17th now. You see kind of that more like whitish, slicky looking thing. That's the oil. Um, so it really spread throughout that whole region. And uh, it was pretty bad, but, you know, as we, we just stated before, we can use our satellites to be able to track this thing and figure out, you know, figure out where the oil is. And it can be kind of hard, you know, when we're, if we're looking at satellite imagery like what we just saw, where it's, 
you know, it's a little bit confusing on which parts are the oil, which parts are the sediment. But if we use, you know, other types like uh, what uh, Tara was just saying with like IR and kind of different types of wavelengths, we can look at an image like this. And so now what we're seeing here is the really light blue regions. Let's see if I could get my mouse on here. Oh no, I went too far Oops. ahead. <laughs> we're not gonna get my mouse on here, but you can see the light blue kind of regions in the top left. That is um, all kind of like the land and vegetation um, of this river delta. The very bright yellow that you're seeing kind of uh, in the, let's call it the bottom right, kind of uh, mixed in between or wedged in between that blue, that is normal like clear water. And so all that other kind of this really dark patch in the bottom right, that's the oil. And if you look around in that, that right image, um, you can kind of see where that red is starting to mix uh, with that dark colors. Oh, and I should have said uh, the red is like normal sediment. So you see a lot of normal sediment coming out of that delta, but you can see where those really dark blue and black uh, regions are starting to kind of move all out in that whole Gulf region. And so this can be really useful because <clears throat> if you just look at the image on the left, it's a little bit tough to tell, okay, what is normal water, what is the land, what is, you know, oil, and what is sediment. But if we use different wavelengths of light from our satellites, then we can get a better picture of the extent of the damage. Right, and that can help us uh, target cleanup efforts to figure out where this oil is going, protect local wildlife, and also protect people. If we see these huge plumes of oil moving towards a coastal city, we can let people know, hey, maybe you should not get in the water tomorrow or something like that. So this is very helpful for protecting wildlife and people too, not just for looking at it and thinking how gross it is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the next one we were going to look at, too, is, again, that sea level rise that we talked about earlier. This is, again, contributed from lots of different things, not just melting glaciers, but all sorts of other stuff that's happening around the world that's causing the sea levels to rise. And again, this is uh, kind of like the temperature one. You're looking at uh, areas that are red are where the sea level is going up abnormally high and blue is where it's going down abnormally high. And so you can see this is really affecting our coastal cities, um, places like that are like Dubai, for instance, or places like Miami and Houston and places that are all along the coasts. It's not just bad because the sea level is rising and it's taking over our coast, but think of how many people live in the city of Miami or New York City or Boston, or these places that are right on the water. That's a ton of people who are at a really high risk. Because as the sea level rises, it's moving inland and it's taking out a lot of these cities. And unfortunately, it's disproportionately affecting minority communities and low income communities, and especially in places like Indonesia and other uh, places that are much less developed than the United States, this is really affecting really vulnerable populations. And so sea level rise may not sound like a big deal to us here in Colorado. We're pretty safe, but there are huge populations of people who will get affected by this. Yeah, and so <clears throat> we can go ahead. I mean, we've been looking at all of the different ways that we can use satellites to view our own Earth and how we can, you know, learn from that, make predictions, and also help out people. Um, but... This is a lot of, you know, earth science and atmospheric science, which is a lot of the work that astronomers do do. But we also study things like stars. And in particular, one star that we care about very, very much being our star, the sun. And so what do we do using satellites to study the sun, Tara? All sorts of cool stuff. All kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> now, besides just making the planet hot, our sun does a lot of other stuff, too. And in particular, you may have heard of these things called solar flares. Or sometimes we have really giant solar flares, which we call a CME, or a coronal mass ejection. This is when the sun basically has a little sort of explosion. And it blows a whole bunch of material off into space 
And that material travels through space and eventually could hit the Earth with all of these really high energy particles from the sun. In addition to that, just kind of sounding scary, um, all of these high energy particles can affect local power grids. It can short out our power grids. It can affect all of our satellites so we could lose communications and internet and GPS, and it could be bad for planes and helicopters. There's a whole lot of stuff that the sun can actually do to harm us here on earth besides just you know making us too hot or giving us skin cancer. It can affect us in a lot of ways. That's right. We definitely want <clears throat> to be able to study the sun and have good, accurate, up-to-date, um, you know, observations of it so that we can better plan for our future. And what else can we do to plan for our future, Tara? Because we've been talking about all these things and all these ways that we have impacted our own Earth. But I think it is important that we take a little bit of time to say, oh, well, everything's not doom and gloom it's not too far gone so let's take a little bit of time to maybe uh start talking about some solutions and then also if you guys have any questions so far i know we're kind of running out of time here so go ahead and type those ch uh, questions in the chat we'll wrap things up and then we'll we'll answer some questions yeah so yeah it's not a hopeless problem. I know climate change seems huge and overwhelming, and it can be, but there are things that we can do to help kind of combat this and at least mitigate it, or even maybe do a little bit of good and help things turn around. Um, the number one thing that you can do to help with climate change is what we call corporate accountability. Now, I know everybody thinks that what can I do as an individual to stop climate change, but one thing that you have to think about, and this is a surprising fact that I learned, is that 100 companies are responsible for 70% of the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere around the world. 100. That's not very many. And that's actually more than it used to be. A couple of years ago, I saw it was 90. And a few years before that, it was only 70. And so there's a huge amount of corporations or just a small amount of corporations that are causing a lot of damage. And so maybe it's not just us as individuals who need to think about this, but one thing that you can do is vote with your dollar. You know, support companies that invest in renewable resources or have sustainable business practices. And a lot of companies, if they do that, they advertise it. They are very proud of it. So that's something that you can do is just be cautious of who you're buying things from, who you're getting your supplies from, who you're patronizing. These are some things that you can do that actually can make a huge difference. But there's individual ways that you can help too, doing things on your own. And there's tons and tons of options there. And some of these you may do well already. Things like recycling and composting. I love composting. That is my favorite thing that we do here in Boulder. I compost everything. It's great. But also um, limiting your fossil fuel use, which goes comes, it's a lot bigger than just, you know, driving less, using less gasoline. It's things like limiting your plastic consumption. Mm. Plastics are made <clears throat> from oil uh leftovers basically and so you know limiting how much you use plastic bags plastic silverware these single use plastics that you just use once and throw away not great those are not great for the environment aside from the fact that they don't decompose pretty much ever but they're also using fossil fuels to create those um Another thing you might think of is eating less factory farmed meat. Eating less meat in general is a great idea because we have, you know, then there's less of this massive agriculture that's going on that uses tons of resources like water and land and creates all of that methane. Uh, there are sustainable meats that you can buy though from local farms, farmers markets, things like that. But really limiting that factory farmed kind of stuff that's really causing a lot of damage is another great thing to do. And maybe the most important thing that you can do is tell other people. When you, if you found a solution that works for you or if you found a new resource or something like that, uh, tell somebody about it. Maybe you have a friend that doesn't know what climate change is, doesn't realize how much the climate affects the whole world. Help educate other people. Spread the word. That's what we're doing here today. Yep. I think that is probably the best way that you could help because in the end, you know, we are all humans on the same earth and we all 
you know, no matter how divided we might be or how, you know, your neighbor might not believe in the same things that you believe in, at the, the core of it, we all want kind of the same things. We all want, you know, a, a safe home, a good community, you know, a happy family, things like that. And so just talking to people about, oh, you know, like, what is climate change? Well, I don't know. Well, do you want a, a good future, uh, you know, where you can ble- breathe easily and you don't have to worry about wearing a mask when you go outside? Um, I know a lot of people are probably getting pretty frustrated with mask wearing, and this is just because of a virus. If we get to a point where, you know, we can't go outside to breathe because the air quality is so low, well, we're going to have to get used to wearing masks pretty quickly. Um, so just talking about it and having starting that conversation and starting with... Um, you're starting with the commonalities that we have um, as humans. I think that's a good way to start the conversation. Absolutely. So let's see, do we have any questions come through? Yeah, go ahead. I know we're, we're running out of time, but let's get any questions that we have or that any of you viewers might have about anything we talked about today, anything we've talked about in the last month, week, year. Anything we haven't talked about, if you want to, if you have a dying, burning question about a black hole, you can ask us about that. Uh, yeah. We are open here for maybe three to five minutes for some, some open Q&A here. Here's a good one that looks like it came through on the form. Have humans changed the earth positively in any way? Yes, we sure have. (laughs) It's not all terrible. Things are getting, you know, things are are difficult and we have challenges, but some of these climate related challenges we've actually made progress on. One thing that's a a really great example of this is the ozone hole. Mm. I don't know if everybody remembers that. That was actually kind of a long time ago. That was a problem that A, we did create. Um, There was a hole in the ozone layer, which is a really important sort of protective barrier in our atmosphere that protects us from harmful rays from the sun. But we were using a lot of um, these particular chemicals that would eat away at that ozone layer and caused a big hole. And so there was a lot of these really harmful solar radiation that was coming and hitting the earth because of that. But once we realized that, we could use our satellites to track the ozone hole and how big it was. And we cut our use of these particular chemicals. They're called chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. So a lot of things that you find in aerosol containers like hairspray and whipped cream and things like that. Um, But by limiting, severely limiting the amount of CFCs that we were using and putting into the atmosphere, that ozone hole was actually able to recover and shrink down. And I believe it's almost, if not, it's completely gone. It's almost completely gone now. So we actually did something good. It was great. (laughs) So that was a big success for for us and climate. Um, I had just thought of another one and now I lost it. It's another great thing. No, that was a good thing. I mean, we've all, overall, we have done a lot of good for the planet. And I think the reason, you know, a lot of people get discouraged when we start talking about climate change too, is because it starts, it, it feels, you know, if, if you suggest to someone that maybe they change the way that they do something, then it can feel like you're getting personally attacked and nobody likes to feel like that. So it's good to, you know, know that, it's not like it's all our fault and everything is just your fault, but we want to start working towards ways because there is a better way to do it. A lot of the things that, you know, a lot of these habits that we've fallen into, we've fallen into for many years and the habits were formed when we didn't know that it was a bad thing to do things like the CFCs. We didn't know it was going to be terrible for the atmosphere, but then we were able to use science and find facts and look at, okay, this is a bad thing. We should do something to change it. And I don't think anybody's life is worse off because we're not using CFCs anymore. You know, we adapted and we found a new way uh, to move forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, looks like we got a question from Chris Grant asking, is it true that there is more overall vegetation on Earth today than there was 50 or 100 years ago? And maybe this is due to us having a warmer overall climate. Hmm. What do you think, Tara? I have not heard that before. I can, I, I would believe that would be true. I could definitely believe that that is a thing, um, that there is more vegetation. I don't know if it would be due to us having a warmer climate 
or possibly to uh, due to just people. We are doing a lot more agriculture than we used to. That warmer climate definitely helps us. Our agricultural zones have expanded drastically because we have places that are not as ice covered as they used to be. Um, people have done a pretty good job at reforestation recently. We still do a lot of deforestation, but there's been huge movements to try to, you know, restore the rainforests in places like Brazil and South America or Indonesia and all of the Papua New Guinea and all the places over in the uh, eastern side of the world. So I would not be surprised if our vegetation has overall increased, um, and it could possibly be due to the warmer climate. Um, that being said, an increase in vegetation by itself is not a bad thing, but if it's due to things like agriculture, we also have to think of why we have so much more vegetation. Part of that could be due to a drastic increase in uh, things like fertilizers and pesticides. And these are terrible <laughs> things for us. These get into the water supply. It's bad for drinking. It's bad for animals. Um, a whole lot of uh, plants that we grow are non-native species in certain areas. And so that can be bad for the soil itself. That's why we have to use more fertilizers. Um, and there's plenty of other plants that don't do well in really hot areas. So we might be increasing the overall vegetation, but decreasing our biodiversity. Things like, you know, there's all sorts of, here in Colorado, we're very familiar with like alpine habitats and all of the crazy little plants that grow on top of mountains. With warming temperatures, we're losing all of those species. They're being replaced by more temperate species, but we're losing our diversity. So that's another thing that you have to think about. The environment is incredibly complex and everything is connected. So changing one little thing over here could change a ton of stuff over here. It's really, it's, it's a really complicated problem. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. <clears throat> yeah, that is a really good one. And so with that, I think if there's not any other ones, Terry, have we gotten any other uh, questions from Ramey on the back end? I don't see anything else that came through. I think that might have been our last one for today. But if you think of any that you uh, just come up with after we're gone, come back and leave us a comment and we'll get those and we'll answer your questions here in the comments or you can drop them in the YouTube form. We do still have one more week of our earth facing dome to homes. So next week we'll be back um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about upcoming missions of these satellites, different satellites and missions that we're launching in the future to help us again with our earth monitoring and all the cool stuff we're gonna learn and find out and look at with all of these upcoming missions. So there's lots of cool stuff coming. Also, like we said at the beginning, tomorrow is Earth Day, Ooh. Thursday the 22nd. That will be Earth Day this year. And so, of course, here at Fisk, we have to have a special program for Earth Day. Uh, so definitely come back tomorrow night around 730. We've got a special speaker that's going to do a whole hour and a half about Earth Day stuff. Uh, it's going to be really, really cool. So I definitely recommend coming and checking that out. It's right here on the YouTube channel. So just come right back here tomorrow night at 7. And I think that should wrap us up for the day. Yep. Got anything think, else, Jeremy? I think that's about it. I don't know if you've said it, but make sure you guys like this video if you liked it. Uh, share it with your friends. Go ahead and subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of these cool videos that we put out there. Um, with that, yeah, Earth Day tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining. We love having this participation. We got a lot of great questions today. I had a blast. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Tara, did you have fun today? I did. That was a lot of fun. Excellent. All right, guys. Have a great rest of your Wednesday and hope to see you tomorrow. We'll see Take you care. next week.